All right, good morning, everyone. Good morning, everybody. We, uh, we decided we're going to get started on time because we have a full few days here, and we want to make sure you get all of the great content and get through mine as quickly as possible. Uh, I want to welcome all of you to our seventh annual Linux Foundation Collaboration Summit. Uh, the number of companies and individuals who are participating uh, here today is terrific. I again, another year where we're getting more and more people uh, coming in. Uh, in particular, that's great because there seems to be 10 tech conferences going on this week. There's OpenStack, there's the Open Networking Center, there's all these things. I think some of you are coming in for this and then you'll be going to another one, so we're really happy to see all of you here. Before I get started, I want to make sure that I thank our sponsors. Uh, an extra large thank you to our platinum sponsors, HP, Intel, Qualcomm, uh, and our gold sponsors, Huawei, IBM, Samsung, and SUSE. Thank you. They made it possible. <laughs> I also want to thank our great event staff who uh, created the event, Amanda McPherson, Angela Brown, and Craig Ross. They're running around. If you need anything, they're here to help you. Uh, so next, I want to go through a couple of logistics here. Uh, the Wi-Fi, probably not going to work, but uh, you, can, uh, you can check it out. Hopefully, it will be working. Uh, if you need any help with that, just grab any of the staff. Uh, and before I actually talk, I want to also welcome the newest Linux Foundation collaborative project, the Zen Project. Uh, today, the uh, Zen Project is coming under the auspices of the Linux Foundation. Uh, it is now 10 years old. And uh, the uh, number of contributors have doubled in just the last few years. Uh, we hope you join us tonight for an attendee reception at the Julie Morgan Ballroom to celebrate the Zen Project's uh, 10th birthday. Buses will be departing in the lobby at 5.30 and 6.30. You can also pick up a map. It is walkable, but uh, we really hope you join us and celebrate this newest addition to the Linux Foundation family. In addition, we've got some new members. Uh, who have joined the Linux Foundation that we want to announce, Hisense, SolarFlare, and Thomas Kren. So please welcome these newest members to the Linux Foundation. All right, I better turn my phone off here before. My great Linux Android phone. There we go. Um, so today I wanted to talk about the state of Linux. And... Uh, you know, I, I get up, at, for many, how many people have been to a Linux Foundation event before? All right, so you know, you know the drill, right? Let me, in fact, I'm just going to save everybody 30, 30 minutes. The state of Linux is freakishly awesome, <laughs> right? Uh, and so, it, actually, instead of talking about the state of Linux, which really in every sector of computing is going uh, swimmingly, I thought I would just step back a little bit this morning and talk about some of the lessons that I've personally learned about how Linux sort of got to where it is today, sort of as a, as a bit player in, in a grander play that's going on around Linux, just sort of from my little corner of the world, some of the lessons that, that I think are important in terms of why Linux has been so successful that might be useful to, to some of you. So I, I thought I'd start off, I think most of you recognize this guy, right? Of course, the Linux crowd. That's Linus Torvalds, right? Creator of Linux. Uh, incredible guy. Um, what, what many of you probably also know, and I know Linus doesn't like it when I describe myself this way, but <coughs> I'm his boss. <laughs> hey, what's, what's so funny? <laughs> no, it's true. I, I'm Linus's boss. You know, he work, he's an employee of the Linux Foundation. I run the Linux Foundation. I'm his boss. I'm also the boss of some other people. I'm also the boss of this person right here. That's right. Does anybody know who this is? A couple of you. You will know who this person is. This is my daughter, Nisha. That's when you all go, ah, right? You know, it's everybody. Right. And what's funny is Nisha and Linus actually share a lot in common. I, I, know, it's, I know it's weird, right? I know it's weird. But, but look at this. But look at the two of them, right? First of all, they're both adorable, right? <laughs> right? They're both geniuses, right? 
trust me, my kid is a genius. <laughs> All right? But most importantly, they share one characteristic. <laughs> Neither of them listen to anything I have to say. Right? But what's crazy is despite Linus and pretty much all of you never listening to anything I have to say, yes, Linux has been incredibly successful and productive. I think many of you have heard me cite these numbers before. They're getting bigger every day. But, you know, every day, 10,519 lines of code get added to, and 6,782 lines of code get subtracted from the Linux kernel every single day. The, the Greg Crow Hartman told me the other day that the rate of change is now 7.38 changes an hour. Where is Greg? He tracks this stuff, which is insane in and of itself. There he is back there. But that, that's just a tremendous rate of change. You know, millions of lines of code added to, in just one year, to a over $10 billion R&D project, over 400 different companies collaborating, many of them as fierce competitors on this just incredible platform that is now more than just an operating system. You know, Linux is really now becoming a fundamental part of society, right? One of the greatest shared technology resources known to man. I mean, it runs all of our stock markets, most of our air traffic control systems, most of the internet, you know, I mean, you know, everything that's pretty, you know, phones, you name it, all, most of the world's telecommunication systems. I mean, this is really now beyond just a movement and an operating system. It's really now this real shared societal important piece of work. And so when I was thinking about that, I thought, how, how do these guys do it? You know, what, what lessons can we learn from Linus, from the kernel community, and, and sort of the open source movement at large that uh, are important? And I came up with kind of five lessons. And, and some of these things may surprise you, but I, I think they're appropriate given this incredible success we've witnessed over the last 20 odd, odd years. Lesson one can be characterized pretty simply. Don't dream big. Don't think too big. Um, you know, when Linus, you know, all of you have seen, this is sort of paraphrasing the, the original email Linus sent out announcing Linux, right? Not doing anything big, you know, I, the only thing I have are AT hard drives, that's all it's ever going to run in, you know. <coughs> I'm doing this for the fun. Linus thought this was such an important concept that he didn't just say it when he announced it on the mailing list, the guy wrote a whole freaking book on it, right? I mean, you know, the, this concept of fun I think is important because when you do something for the fun, when you do something as an artist, and I consider many of the developers who work on Linux as poet coders, you know, I don't think a lot of Linux developers, uh, to use sort of the, the painter analogy, I mean, I think they're more like the Da Vinci's than a house painter, right? These are creative, brilliant people. And I think it's important to reflect on, you know, Linus wasn't thinking of some master grand huge plan. He was doing it for fun, and, and I think that's what drives a lot of people. What's more interesting about this lesson is a guy named Daniel Pink recently came along. How many people have read this book, Drive? It's a New York Times bestseller. You, not a lot of readers in the room. <laughs> All right, that's fine. I'll tell you about it. Uh, this book is about what motivates people, right? And, and it gets back to this idea of having fun. And what Tom, Daniel Pink describes in this book is what really motivates people. And he cites this incredible study at MIT, where they took a group of students, and they divided them into groups, and they gave them rewards, you know, and with the idea of, like, more reward, more money means better performance. And so they gave one group was paid low, one was medium, one, one was very high, very, very high reward. And what was interesting is for sort of menial tasks, sort of manual labor, uh, the results were what you would expect. The more you pay, the better the performance, right? But when they gave these folks creative tasks, tasks like coding, the people who got more pay, who got the big reward, did worse. Weird, right? And they thought, well, maybe this is kind of localized to MIT students because they're crazy. Uh, no offense to anyone who went to MIT in here. Uh, but they thought, well, let's go try the same study in India where we'll divide people into groups and we'll you know, have low pay, sort of medium pay, and then we'll give the highest performers two months' salary, essentially. And when they did this, again, same thing. For sort of manual labor, 
you know, the more you pay, the better people perform. But again, when it came to creative tasks, the highest paid folks, the people who were getting two months pay, did worse. Did worse. And what Daniel Pink describes in the book, and I really encourage you to go out and read this, I think it's a fascinating book, is that money's not what motivates. What motivates is things like autonomy, mastery, and purpose. These are sort of the three biggest things that really motivate people. And he actually cites Linux in the book as a classic example of where, by doing it for fun, you know, it's like taking guitar lessons on the weekend. You don't do it because you're getting paid. You do it because you want to master the guitar, right? By doing it in, to master something, by creating this kind of incredible code, by being a part of something bigger than yourself, be, you know, having purpose, right? By having the autonomy to be able to work by yourself, but also collectively, that's what's really motivating people. And so I think that, you know, this idea of just having fun not only is a lesson that can be learned from Linux and is cited here, but has also been backed up by sort of scientific evidence about what really motivates people. But having fun isn't just the only lesson that I've learned. I think the other lesson that we all understand in this room is, you know, why not give it all away, right? And, you know, it's funny, to this day, despite the incredible success of Linux, Every time I tell this to people, like, oh, you, know, you should just give it all away. You know, it's open source. You know, anybody can use Linux to do anything they want. You know, as long as they share back the changes they make, if they make something, you know, that just by giving it all away, people always ask me the same question. Well, how are you going to make money, right? How are you going to I get this from everyone. Does anybody know how you make money on Linux? Does anybody here make money in any way, shape, or form with Linux at all? Yeah, I didn't think so. I, I, you know, the thing I show them when, when I get asked this question is, is this. <coughs> Here are three companies, one based completely on free and open source software, one kind of a hybrid uh, open source software, and the one pretty much based on proprietary software. And you can see who's making money in this world. Red Hat at the top in the last half decade has nearly doubled in their market value. IBM, who sells hardware with a lot of free software in it has gone up uh, almost uh, 85, 86 right? percent. Uh, and Microsoft is basically, you know, proprietary software company has been flat during that same period of time. Clearly the market is showing us that there is not only ways to make money by giving away code, products and services and support and all the things we already know about, but they're, they're rewarding that with real money, right? This is not fake money. If you had invested in all three of these companies, the company you would have done best with is the one that is based entirely on open source software. So you can make money by giving things away. The third lesson that I've learned by observing all of you folks, and Linus in particular, is don't have a plan, right? You guys, you know, it's, it's crazy, you know, there's no real plan to Linux. It just, it drives the product managers crazy, right? But somehow with no plan, you know, this kind of success has been achieved in the market, you know. 1.3 million mobile phones are activated every single day with Linux, the Android. 92% of the world's high-performance computing systems, Linux. 700,000 televisions activate, you know, sold every single day containing Linux. 85% of the world's stock market, you know, a thousand trillion dollars transacted on just one Linux system. You know, how is this happening in every single category and sector of computing across these wildly varied markets if you guys don't have a freaking plan, right? It's crazy. And I think John Corbett uh, is, so, does a good job of sort of summarizing uh, this in, in how he describes the roadmap for, for Linux, which is really more of a weather forecast, right? It's sort of where the winds are blowing technically, right? But it's not really, you know, here's the roadmap. I never hear him say, here's the roadmap for Linux. Um, and, and I think what he appreciates and I appreciate, and this is the lesson of having no plan, is letting organic communities form 
is I think one of the great assets of Linux and open source, allowing for people to come in, scratch their own itch. You know, if I'm wanting to have better battery life on a mobile device, I'm going to come in and optimize uh, the technology so that that can happen. You know, that same technology can benefit a high performance computing user because their number one cost is power and cooling. But everybody's coming in sort of forming their own communities completely organically. And I think that is a tremendous strength. And I think you'll see that as a way that companies and the whole industry and just society moves with technology in the future. Because I think, you know, again, you know, John Corbett is, is I think the weather forecast analogy is so great here because, uh, you know, nobody can predict the weather, just like nobody can predict technology trends, right? How many people here have tried to predict technology trends? A few of you. I do it all the time. I always get it wrong, right? And so I finally figured it out, you know? D just go with it. You know, sort of look where the winds are going, generally think about it, and you don't really need a plan. And in addition, you know, I mean, the, the, the thing that's funny about all these lessons is, you know, don't think big, give it all away, don't have a plan. I mean, it's like, what else could you do that's sort of counterintuitive uh, and that would be important here? And I think the, the next lesson is you don't always have to be nice, right? Which is, is, is do we get some ooze in the audience there? <coughs> we got a couple right there. I, well, see, but I'm not a developer, so I think the, the, the answer was I always have to be nice, and that is correct. And so, and by the way, you know, when this happens, Right? When we get a big flame war going, uh, if you ever want the uh, politically correct tr uh, translation, just give me a call and I'm happy to explain what people really meant. But, but <laughs> I think we all get the flame war thing. And, and I do, on one serious note about not being nice, um, I think we could be more appropriate, right? And seriously, I think, you know, I think people could be more appropriate on, on mailing lists and in their decorum with other people. And I certainly try to do that. But that's not the, the, the point I'm trying to make right now. The point I'm trying to make right now is that challenging other, each other's ideas may not be nice sometimes. You're not nice sometimes when you do that. But let me give you another study that, uh, that Berkeley, uh, the yeah, professor of psychology at UC Berkeley, conducted in 2003 where they took a group of individuals and they tried to come up with uh, how people come up with great ideas. They took uh, some groups, brought them together, and they said, okay, this group is going to come up with ideas via the traditional brainstorming method, right? So we're gonna get everybody into a room, no idea is a bad idea, don't criticize others, and Brainstorm away, right? How, how many people here have ever brainstormed like that, right? Everybody, right? They took another group and said, this group, we want you to debate. We want you to challenge each other's ideas. We want you to really, essentially, argue. Defend your ideas. Stand up for them. And here was the interesting result. The debate group didn't just perform better, they crushed it. They came up with like eight times as many ideas they came up with more depth of their, with their ideas. They, even after the study, they kept coming up with more and more ideas. They really just kind of trounced the brainstormers, right? And it sort of makes sense, right, that when you are challenging each other's ideas, when you're really sort of, you know, arguing sometimes over this, that the best ideas really kind of percolate to the top. And you just get more depth of those ideas as people are exploring them from different angles, you know, reconsidering their position based on, you know, a healthy debate. And so, yeah, you know, it's not always nice, right? Could we be more appropriate? Yes. But I think that that healthy debate matters. And I, I witness that in Linux and in other open source projects all the time. <coughs> and then my final lesson when I look at what folks are doing here is that in addition to you know doing it for fun having no plan giving it away being jerks right that there's another new movement going which are just kind of all semi absurd but i think they're important but there's another new trend that i'm witnessing right now 
that I think is going to define the next decade. And that is, this whole movement is now really becoming institutionalized. And when I say institutionalized, I mean it in a, a, a sort of a very broad sense. In that, so for so long, companies have thought of R&D as sort of internal research and development. And there's a line item on your financial statement. We spend you know, X amount of dollars on research and development. It's a billion dollars for very, very large companies. But the best firms these days are now actually investing in formalized external R&D. And I, I think this isn't a new idea in that, you know, for all of us that have been around open source for a long time, we all get the power of collaboration and this form of development. But what I think is really happening is that you're seeing now specialized groups within different companies sort of bringing together you know, a leader whose job is literally, I am in charge of external development. I'm going to go pick open source projects that are important to our organizations or our, comp our company or country's goals. I'm going to build a team of people so that we can influence these different projects. And I see this, you know, I see, uh, you know, Ahmad Susu at, at Intel is a great example. He runs that group. Um, you know, uh, Samsung recently hired a guy named Ibrahim Haddad, who used to work for the Linux Foundation, but now is heading up that sim same group at Samsung. You know, you see this, you know, Chris DeBona down at Google, and I'm just, you know, I'm not picking on anyone, I'm just randomly picking some names. But I think that's a huge trend that we're going to see in the future. And, I, you know, I'm seeing this because what we're now seeing is really most technology is really being defined by this collaborative development as you look at any new sector of technology emerging. The, 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 the specialization, the managing of external R&D has happened because, you know, if you look at it, whether it's big data with things like Hadoop, whether it's the cloud with things like OpenStack and Eucalyptus or virtualization with KVN and Zen, or, you know, just last week we, we announced a collaborative project at the Linux Foundation called Open Daylight in software-defined networking. You know, here we, we got, you know, a dozen of the largest networking companies in the world to commit hundreds of developers and millions of dollars to, you know, create that next generation of abstraction in the data center, you know, at that networking layer with software-defined networking. I mean, 10 years ago, that wouldn't have happened. And when I interact with all of these different projects and different companies, they all now are seeing that this form of development really is defining every big technology movement that happens today. And so in that world where you have this mass collaborative development, that specialization is really taking place. And so those, those are sort of my lessons to all of you that I'd love you to take back to your organizations or whoever you're working with or whatever project you're working on. Right? Do it for fun. Do it for the mastery of it. Do it for the excellence. You know? Give it all away. That really is the best way these days to create value. Don't try and plan everything out. Allow organic communities to form. Right? You don't always have to be nice. Be polite, for God's sake, but don't have to be nice. And then harness this specialization that's going on in the industry, right, where people are really focusing on this external R&D. And when you do that, when you build the trust relationships across companies and people by sort of mastering many of these skills, you can really, really create incredible things, right? And in that world, where people are working in this way organically, where they're mastering all of these things, and I may be talking myself out of a job here, you really don't actually need a boss. So that's my talk. I want to thank you guys for listening to me. But uh, you know, the real show today and over the next few days is all of the different projects and the different parts of Linux that are going to be highlighted at this event.